Eating disorders, body image and, and mental health, so some really important topics. And again, a lot to discuss. We've got a, a really great lineup on the panel. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll introduce your host and moderator for the panel. That's Stephanie Preisner, who you'll all know. Um, Stephanie is a screenwriter, author, and weekly columnist for the Sunday Independent uh, Life magazine. And she hosts a popular uh, podcast called Basically with Stephanie Preisner. And she's also a regular contributor to radio and TV and was nominated and diagnosed with autism and has been a fantastic for organizing this today. Um, and yes, in, in, in the spirit of transparency and touching back to the last panel, I am autistic and sitting still is not my strong point. I've been sitting still for quite a while, so this is why I have this uh, thing that I'll be squeezing if any of you are wondering. Um, all the other moderators seem to have printed out their notes and seem very professional. I'm just gonna read from my phone just in case you think I'm texting or anything. Um, uh, so I have an amazing panel uh, to, to moderate today with some brilliant voices and expertise on a topic that's really close to my heart and you know kind of impacts us all here today. First up, um, I'll start chronologically, is Dr. Tara Logan Buckley. Dr. Tara Logan Buckley is a chartered senior clinical psychologist. She received her undergraduate higher diploma and master's degree from UCC. She went on to complete her doctorate in clinical psychology at Trinity. Her specialist residency was in an Irish specialised weight management service, which is a key area of interest to her. She based her doctoral dissertation on the complexity of obesity within forensic settings, where she has provided military veterans in Europe. Privately, Tara's main area of work is in disordered eating, in particular binge eating and or obesity, using a compassion-focused therapy framework. This allows her to explore the narrative of self, increases self-worth, self-esteem, and improves one's relationship with food and body. Tara has created webinars and workshops for various global corporate clients regarding mental health for employees and management, as well as content and psychological first aid. Tara has been a guest speaker on various podcasts, radio shows and conferences, and has presented her research on bariatric surgery and obesity, both at national and international level. She is a member of the Psychology, Psychological Society of Ireland and in its clinical division. Up next is Minister Mary Butler. Thanks so much for being here today. I'm sure you have an awful lot to be doing. Uh, Mary is a lifelong community activist and a member of Fianna Fáil. She was first elected to the Dáil to represent the Waterford constituency in 2016. In her first term, Mary was appointed Fianna Fáil spokesperson for older people and health promotion, chaired the all-party Oireachtas group on dementia, the special Dáil committee with responsibility for... <laughs> um, Harriet Parsons is next up, and Harriet is from Bodywise, which is an amazing resource. Um, she's a fully accredited psychoanalytic psychotherapist. She holds an MSc in psychoanalytic psychotherapy from St. Vincent's Hospital School of Psychotherapy, UCD, an MA in addiction studies from DBS, and a BA in psychology from DBS. She joined Bodywise, the Eating Disorders Association of Ireland in 2005, and has worked with the organization ever since. Currently, her, um, she is the training and development manager working to provide support, the support component by BodyWise to the HSE National Clinical Program for Eating Disorders. In addition to this, she gives frequent training to many professional groups, GPs, psychiatrists, youth workers, foster carers, social care workers, and others. She regularly lectures at third level on the subject of eating disorders in UCD, UCC, TCD School of Nursing and Midwifery. She's a regular media spokesperson on the subject of eating disorders for the organization. She is a member of ICP and registered with APPI and CUNY. And finally, we have nursing. She currently practices as a senior nurse officer in the Irish Prison Service. Kate has been dedicated to empowering and educating women in Ireland on issues of women's health. She's a fervent advocate for cutting out the myths and fiction regarding women's health while promoting and prioritizing their well-being. She is married with two children. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm going to start with Harriet from Bodywise um, about the issues that are faced by women engaging with your service at the moment. What are you seeing? Um, well, we see people, I suppose women across the board, engaging with services. So we provide support services. So we provide um, support to people who have an eating disorder, but also those who support a person with an eating disorder. And of those engaging, obviously, um, the majority are women. At the moment, looking at the figures um, for families who are attending the Family Support Programme, 
the majority are supporting somebody who's under 18, a female under 18 diagnosed with anorexia. But when you look broader at our other support services, you see that yes, there are the under 18s, but also there's a huge proportion of people who are over 18 and adults. Um, and a, a few years ago, um, the main age category was over 35. So, um, you know, people who use our services are of all ages, all types of eating disorders, um, and who are coming to us at all points on their journey, so to speak. Um, we've seen since COVID a huge increase in people presenting with eating disorders. Of all kinds? Yeah, of all kinds, but particularly with anorexia and particularly in the um, girls in under 18. Um, we've seen um, increases in all types of eating disorders, but in particular anorexia, and also ARFID, which is, an, which is an eating disorder that often goes along with a diagnosis of autism. Um, that's also um, increasing all the time. We're hearing people coming forward. Um, but that's the main category of people who are using our services. Um, people, when COVID hit, people tipped into an eating disorder who already were a bit vulnerable, um, people's eating disorder symptoms became worse because of the change in circumstance, routine, service support. So people relapsed as well. Size in a certain way, um, restrict, have very strict routines as a way of establishing structure and um, boundaries, I suppose, for themselves in a world where all of our normal boundaries kind of fell away. Yeah, um, I have spoken publicly before about the fact that I have an eating disorder. Um, I am on the positive end of it now. Um, I live with anorexia and bulimia. Do you find that with BodyWise there, because sometimes when you're in that mindset, yeah. the last thing you want to do is get help or have someone take your eating disorder away from you because it yeah. feels like a protection. It feels like the only thing you can control in the world. Yeah. Do the people who contact BodyWise, is it very often a concerned person, for like a concerned parent, a concerned sibling, or do you find that people actually can self-identify, I have a problem and I want help? What's the balance there? It's 50-50, Stephanie, really. Um, you've identified one of the core um, problems around providing support for people with eating disorders, that we have to understand that the eating disorder is a coping mechanism. And so, um, because it's a coping mechanism, we all have coping mechanisms that we use. And if I came along to anybody and said, you're not allowed to do that, we would feel a bit defensive and we would resist. And so that's one of the really difficult things about um, eating disorders is that a person who has an eating disorder is conflicted in their head. There is a part of them that wants maybe to let it go, but there's another part of them that clings to it. And so the challenge for us within our organization is to um, provide support in a way that makes people feel safe to come and speak about their experience, speak about the feelings that they're having, um, what they're finding um, difficult, how they're suffering, without that expectation you know, that we want them to change or that we're going to make them do something they're not ready for. So as a support organization, we kind of have that luxury that we're, we're non-directive, so people can use our services, and it is just about the here and now, you know, what are you going through? So our ethos would be, we don't talk about food or weight, we talk about how people are feeling about what they're doing, um, and that way we try and keep it safe for everybody. And so that's for the people themselves who have an eating disorder, and then when family get in touch with us, of course, a family are often in the position where they um, understand why the person can't see we kind of put together a family package and what we've seen in COVID is that people are presenting far more physically unwell and in a far more urgent situation so the people who are using our services at the moment the families who are using our services at the moment are supporting people who are like very physically unwell um, and so they, they need ongoing support. I'll come back to you. I, I could talk to you all day, but I'll come back to you. <laughs> um, I'm going to move on to, to you, Tara, um, because I think it's interesting that you work both publicly with the HSE and privately um, in a private practice. What are the issues that you are seeing coming to your clinics? Are they the same in both public and private? And what are the barriers in access to care? 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, for me, both public and private, it is kind of, it, it's the same presentations that, that we're getting to see. Obviously, within the, um, the private people have better access and they usually have more um, money to be able to access these services as compared to the public service. However, presentations across the board um, in the areas that I work in would be particularly the same. Um, I'm seeing a massive influx in um, disordered eating, particularly in, in binge eating coming to presenting to me. Is there a difference between disordered eating and an eating disorder? Sorry, just to differentiate. Um, so I don't like the word eating disorder personally. That's, okay. that's me. I don't know if you feel the same. I much prefer the word disordered eating. Um, I, I just think it takes away because a lot of people blame themselves. A lot of people believe I am the eating disorder, whereas I always say, no, it's an it. We try to kind of depersonalize that from the self. And I think that's a really important part of the recovery. So for me, I much prefer the terminology disordered eating. Okay. Um, they're kind of in and one of the same thing. It kind of depends on what you want to use. But I just think it's a nicer way of looking at that because a disorder can be quite a strong word to use with someone whereas you kind of say, well, no, it's just your eating in instead. Like, you know, it's a disordered eating pattern and we can, we can change this and we can work on that. Um, it seems to um, represent people a lot better with that. So I'm seeing a massive influx in that. I'm seeing a lot of body, body image issues coming in as well. Um, I think with COVID, um, in particular with people being quite ill or with people maybe um, either losing weight or gaining weight within that time, a lot of body issues and self-esteem coming in. I think there is always going to be um, an issue with access to care. Um, in my experience, I think the influx of referrals that we're getting both publicly and privately, there isn't enough clinicians in order to be able to deal with the referrals that, that we're getting. Um, in one of the services that I'm in, we're seeing maybe 100 referrals a month um, with a base of only two to three psychologists. <laughs> and I never will be one, but like how many clinical hours would be kind of what we can give out before we hit burnout ourselves. And there's a lot more to psychology than just actually that one-to-one -one interaction. We do an awful lot of collateral reports, assessments outside of that as well. So you're looking really at 20 client hours per week is what I would say, that you're, you're, you're keeping yourself well and you're also being there for your client as well, which is a really, really important factor. So when you think about that, they're usually long-term clients as well. So you can kind of only maybe see 20 to 30 people a month. Really. Right, okay. So, um, and that's not taking in, we obviously have people who are waiting longer in services as well that need to come first. So what you're doing is you're trying to play catch up with services the entire time with wait lists that are there for two or three years while also adding on to that monthly. Um, and this is a big issue that we're seeing as well is staff retention. Um, staff are hitting burnout very, very easily within both public and private. Um, our wait lists are, are years um, for some services and staff just we just can't keep doing that we're just burning staff out there just isn't enough of us and we're just not able to deliver in the capacity for that amount of time continuously and why and maybe a minister I can come to you at the end for this but is why why are there not enough clinicians is it that like from secondary school it's just not something people want to go in and train in is it that the, the points are too high or they're getting trained really well and they're going abroad like from you and your colleagues what's the sort of anecdotal and then I can ask the minister like what of course um, so for me I think a big thing is funding if I'm 100% honest um, to get on to a doctorate in clinical psychology um, it is it takes about 10 years so it's a very very long road from the day that you kind of go into university day one until you get qualified you are looking at kind of eight to ten years for that process so if you just if you're saying to a young person that's 18 or 19 it's going to take you 10 years before you qualify and we can't even guarantee that because you need experience in between a lot of people are very put off by that another thing within psychology that people don't understand is we're very mathematic based so we, okay. we do statistics, which shock an awful lot of people when you come into psychology. You think, oh, I'm not going to just sit there and talk to people. It's like, no, we have to do research. We have to present. We, and people get very taken back by that. So the points are quite high for psychology. Um, funding, because to get into clinical psychology, there's only a set amount of places in Ireland in each of the universities. And it's actually quite small. So what we would need to see, person, what I would think would need to happen is that we have more funding for more clinical spaces because there are so many people that want to get on that and they get to so disheartened because it is a really, it, it, it takes a long time to get there and then the spaces are so short, it might take one additional few years to get on these programs. So I think that if we, we tend to want to work within Ireland, we very, very recovery rate. How possible is it for people to recover from these eating disorders or these disordered eating patterns? Is it something that people have for life? that can come back at any time? Or, or do you see a really positive, like actually we can work with people in a CBTE model for 20 weeks and generally they're fine. I'll, I'll come to you first on that. Well, people do recover from eating disorders. It's absolutely possible to recover and recover fully. So um, 
you know, often peop sometimes people think of an eating disorder like an addiction, you know, that it's something that you'll always struggle with, that you, um, and it has lots of similarities in that way, but where it differs in, is in terms of recovery. People can absolutely recover. Now, not everybody recovers, but um, so early intervention is key, um, and really it's about having the flexibility to find a treatment approach that works for that person. One of the difficulties is that starting out, maybe um, you don't always know what's going to work, and you don't always know what's not going to work, so, but it is absolutely possible to recover. At the support group yesterday morning, um, there was uh, a mum there whose daughter hasn't um, been able to recover yet, but there were other parents at the group who um, had young teenager, teenage girls um, you know, who are currently in treatment, and she was like, my daughter hasn't recovered, but I have seen so many people come through the same service and recovered. And there's enough hope there for her oh, to hold absolutely, on to that. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Tara, yeah. I might give you the last word on that, and then I'm gonna to go to Kate. Yeah, absolutely, I 100% agree. And I think the lovely thing is recovery is very different for everybody. Mm. So, you know, recovery for one person might mean one thing, for someone else it might mean something different. Mm. And I think you picked a lovely point is that it's, um, it's different for every single person, and a really important thing is that not every one modality will work. So you mentioned like CBTE which is absolutely fantastic however that's not the one size fits all for everybody so I think it's great that we can use kind of an integrated approach with everybody and make it really individualized but the recovery for them is is for them in particular and using different frameworks within that as well but definitely um, recovery is very very possible well that's yeah. that's positive positive. Um, Kate I'm gonna come to you next um, and sort of maybe move away from just simply eating disorders and um, from your work what are your what are the sort of mental health issues that you will be dealing with most in your work? Um, from my experience, work experience, we traumatic experience, like normal or in 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 in, 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 in general terms, and when they come into prison because of their isolation and you know the stress level factors and fear of you know their issues, you know, convictions and all that, they come on, th their, their stress levels are heightened up and it begins to, you know, just affect them, you know, they get depressed and from the, the isolation from their social life as well, their families and others are not also, you know, helpful because now they, they find out that they can't be there for their families, they are just there facing unknown, you know, sentence and, you know, there's a lot of factors, you know, around that and their, their health, their mental health begins to, you know, deteriorate and it just becomes a vicious cycle, you know, if, despite all the facilities and resources that are there to support them, both medically, you know, uh, psychologically, behaviorally, they still, you know, don't really get settled because they're still, still in the environment that is constantly reminding them, you know, and aggravating their stress level, and basically that's not helpful for them. Yeah, so you see substance abuses as well, you know, because, you know, a lot of them, you know, would be people that have, you know, been involved in uh, uh, social um, substance misuse, and they come in and they are also craving for that while in the prison, and that's also helping, you know, to fuel their, their mental health. Uh, de deviation and it does not help and then they just come you know constantly you know the thread between you know inmates and all that you know there are gangs you know everyone people are just you know unrelaxed in fact the environment is so tense and that helps them you know to to degenerate and a lot of times things get settled at some point depending on who it is and how like if it's a, a, when you get, when they get sentenced and they're able to relax and they know a little bit, you know, they, what their future holds for them, you can now begin to work on them and they can understand, you know, and be focused on how to get help and, you know, get better. But otherwise, it just keeps going on and on and the isolation does not help them as well. I think that's fascinating that actually it's the uncertainty yeah, yeah. that can want to know, even if it's like really yeah. bad news, I just want to know. Like, this is a really difficult environment for me. Yeah. I'm in a really stressful situation and I can't change my situation. Maybe it's a work thing. Maybe you're in a relationship. Maybe you've got family issues. How can you promote positive mental health when you can't impact the situation around you? 
that's very uh, interesting uh, point. Now, we know education is fundamental, you know, to helping people understand the situation they are and how they can actually come out of it. You know, contrary to those in the prison, you know, they don't have, you know, choice over their environment. They are stuck in the prison. But for us women, like we're talking about women here and also how to help impact, you know, our community, help, you know, our environment impact on, on the future, women and, you know, health. Education goes a long way because a lot of the time people, especially we women, we tend to be very resilient. You know, we, we, we are going through stressful situations, very traumatic situations, but we cover up because we don't want to expose our weaknesses. We don't want to expose our families. A lot of women have gone through a lot of, you know, violence, violence dom domestic violence, and they're covering up. And yeah, this, what it does to them now is just to put them under repressed emotion. You know, they, and when you are under repressed emotion, it's, it's in, it affects your mental health even worse than when you can act out because some of us don't really want to act out and we, we, we kind of just want to keep going. And talking to people, ex explaining them to them the, 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 the importance of opening up, like we've always, you know, from the, from the first panel, we talked about opening up, you know, coming out. Some of these things have, you know, long been covered up. And that's why a lot of the times it affects, you know, the, 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 the effect of mental health, you know, it's impact on women more than men because men tend to act out. They can, you know, just explode or just give out. But women, we tend to, tend to be on the conservative side. But talking to people, even confiding to your, your friends or seeking help, you know, is very, very imperative because when you hold that to yourself, it eats you up, it adds more pressure, and you cannot help yourself. There are a lot of resources out there, you know, the government are providing a lot of resources. I know that there's, there's a shortage, you know, in psychologists and psychiatric people or nurses or health because of the, you know, pressure that is impacted every day, even with COVID. But you can still get out there. You can get help, you know, speak to people, tell people what you're passing through, and also take your mental well-being into your own hands because it is a fundamental, you know, thing in life. If we don't, if our mental health is not, you know, in order, we can't function, you know, in any other way. It is very, very fundamental for our reasoning, our social interactions, you know, the way our productivity. And if we are not mentally balanced, it is very difficult. So we need to be advocates as women, you know, and be champions of, you know, advocating and helping people to, you know, as advocates of mental health, tell people this, if you're going through this problem, talk, speak to someone, seek help, and early help, you know, helps to resolve some of these issues. And another thing I also, you know, identified from, you know, the pre my, 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 my experience from the prison, like I said earlier, is isolation. A lot of us come to a point that we are isolated, you know, in our society, in either because of our racial, ethnic or gender or you know belief system you know we are in the minority and we find ourselves you know that we are isolated or even in our families wherever we are and we suffer people suffer you know in these uh, uh, circumstances and it impacts on their mental health which i think so, was really yeah. clear during COVID. Yeah. how uh, isolation i love what you're saying there okay it's just about like just speaking about it because i do think that sometimes mental health like particularly during COVID I feel like mental health was just bandied around as a term like you need to open the salons because of my mental health and as someone who has an actual mental health condition it was like oh my god mental health and mental illness are not the same thing and you wanting to get your roots done is not the same as like someone not being able to get out of bed and not being able to open the fridge because they're too terrified of the food and uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll come to you last on this about the difference be, uh, be, based on your clinical training, the difference between mental health and mental illness and pathologizing sometimes anxiety, which sometimes is a natural and very appropriate response 
and we pathologize it and then everyone thinks that anxiety is the worst thing in the world. Yes, you've picked up on a, a definitely a few topics there. So our anxiety comes from our threat-based system and it's in a part of our brain called our reptilian brain. We've all heard of the reptilian brain before. We all have it. If we have, if even have dogs, cats at home, they all work off the reptilian brain. So what happens is our old brain reacts to threat in a split second because it acts on a better safe than sorry principle. So what's happening in modern day society is we're getting all of these signals sent to us. Our old brain is going, oh no, there's a threat. I need to react on that threat. And that's where our anxiety, our fear, or our anger comes from. And what's happening is people are not realizing that this is what's going on. It's a flaw within the system because we're, we're still catching up with evolution. And as a result, the word anxiety is being overused. Um, I think mental illness is being over pathologized. Um, if we think of like the word narcissism, how many times have we heard, oh, that person's such a narcissist because they put up a photo, for example, yeah. on, on social media? But in fact, actually, to get a, a diagnosis of narcissism actually takes an awful lot. You know, there's, there's only about criteria three to four percent to of people that can actually meet the criteria. So I think what's happening is we're coming into a society where we're throwing around these words. Um, and actually, in fact, it, it's a little bit incorrect because it's completely natural to have anxiety. I was absolutely bricking it before I came up here today. Absolutely, okay? And that is very, very normal. And the reason for that is because I want a shot of adrenaline to get me through here. I want to be hypervigilant, to be able to listen to everybody on this panel, take it in with active listening, and forget about what's happening in the room in front of me. So my bit of anxiety has done me a favor. But do we ever hear that about anxiety? Do we ever hear it talked about that? If your child is going playing a football match, they want to be a little bit anxious. It's going to do them well. You want to sit in the exam, you want a little bit of that. But we're hearing so many negative things about anxiety or low mood or emotional regulation when in fact, and touching your point, which is beautiful, is it's all down to awareness and education. We need to make people aware. We need to make them educated that these are not scary things. They're all part of us being human. We all have this beautiful shared human experience and we're all individual in that process. And as you said, there is a big difference between having a mental disorder or mental illness and mental health. We all in this room have mental health difficulties. Every single person, it is completely normal. We have days where we're stressed, we have days where things are a little bit too much, we have a day where we're a little bit low. We, as females, we have a day where we're a little bit more irritable depending on that time of the month or how the hormones are and everything like that. Our mental health is, has to be number one priority. So many times people come into me and I ask them, can you write down your list of priorities, please? And it's frightening sometimes to see that mental health comes in at four or five. And I say, okay, well, if I impact that, your number four thing, what happens to one, two, and three? And they realize, oh, wait, they're for your children, your partners, of your abilities or do the things. And obviously, if mental health affected, that's the same. But we're looking at, as you said, someone who cannot get out of the bed, where me asking someone to go and brush their teeth is the same as asking someone who's functioning well to climb Mount Everest. Mm -hmm. And I always make that comparison that I'm aware when I'm dealing with someone who is in an, a depression that's clinically diagnosable, to do these small little behavioral tasks is asking them. Huge. It's huge. So for me, that's the difference. It's the impact on how it is on your everyday functioning. So I think the language is really important in how we speak about it. Minister, finally going to give you a chance to speak. So you've been the Minister for Mental Health now, fast maths, fast maths, like two, two years, two, yeah, two years if? July. Yeah, so yeah. When, you, when you came into the brief first, what did you notice? What, I'm, I'm sure it was a fast learning experience for you, but what did you see were the things that were like urgent and, 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 and how did that all go? Okay, thanks Stephanie for that and it's really interesting um, listening to the panel. So when I came into post on the 1st of July uh, in, in 2020, I suppose what you have to decide is what you want to prioritise because yep. you can't do everything. With the best of intentions, you can't do everything. So a couple of things that we have done and I think we're doing them um, quite well is to prioritise. So the first thing I prioritised initially straight away was in relation to eating disorders because in 2018 the clinical programme for eating disorders was launched Right. It's a really, really good program. Um, it's, it's led by Dr. Michelle Clifford, working in tangent with BodyWise and the Department of Psychology when, at the time, it was um, put in place in 2018. The data they had from 2016 and 2017 suggested that maybe 60 people would present with an eating disorder. To six, the zero. Six, six zero. Right. Might present to the clinical programs. Last year, 504 people were referred. And these are the clinical programs, so this wouldn't be private practice. Okay. So initially, um, 6.85 6 million euro was allocated. Um, it started off very well in 2018, 
and unfortunately in 2019 for some reason the money was suspended so even though we started incrementally to build three um, eating disorder teams we need 16 in total so when I came in the first thing I did was reinstated that funding okay so uh, first year that it was in we're putting in place three teams so I discovered last year that the three teams weren't fully populated so I allocated the 3.94 million that wasn't spent so we're, we put in three more teams last year and this year there's three more teams going in so by the end of this year we will have nine teams in place we need to incrementally things you know that I was really conscious of is depending on where you live what supports you can access so I'm from Waterford and there is no eating disorder team in CHO5 which covers five counties by December of this year we will have an adult team in place so what I want to see is an ad, uh, two teams in each CHO so I'm doing it incrementally we'll have nine this year I allocated 1.15 million again what I am pleased to say is 44 staff were hired into eating disorder teams last year Okay. Um, so, you know, we're talking about recruitment and recre retention. It is difficult. It can take up to 50 weeks to recruit somebody through the HSE. Like, it's crazy stuff. But we have, we got 44 people in, um, in relation to eating disorders. So these are multidisciplinary teams led out by consultant psychiatrists, consultant psychologists, um, you know, like dieticians, sorry, OTs, yeah. the whole way down the line, a multidisciplinary team. And the one thing I do want to say is we really have good inpatient supports for young people under 18 so we have um, you know we have um, Merlin Park we have Aisling we have Lindara and we, ha we, we have a second one in Dublin so we do have dedicated supports there for young people but everyone on the panel is absolutely right like 75% of all presentations last year were in relation to anorexia nervosa but 93% of them were ages between 15 and 17, and they were all young girls. Okay. So there's a shocking um, amount of young girls who have presented with an eating um, disorder or disordered eating, which I really like, during COVID. And it all comes back to, I met with several groups of young girls who were in transition year, and they all said, they're so pressurized with social media. They're so pressurized with TikTok. So during the very first wave of COVID, all the transition year students told me, they all went on TikTok. And the pressure started to come then in relation to the body consciousness, the body imaging, and just to be absolutely perfect, the hair, the makeup, the clothes, whatever you're doing, and the pressure came from there. And you know, I think it's really important to say that Anorexia nervosa, eating disorders, they are among the most severe of mental health conditions. So sometimes when a parent might say to a young person, for God's sake, sit down there and eat that, they actually can't. Yeah, and I think it the is statistic a very, is that very serious condition. Of all mental health issues, of all mental health issues that exist, anorexia nervosa is the one that you're most likely to die from because yes. it's so, so yes. crucial. I'm just wondering, Minister, are you doing any, or just to Tara's point about like, clinicians and getting clinicians in mm. obviously that's not just your job are you no. like is there work being done with simon harris the minister there of is. higher education there just is. to try and entice yeah. people so i'm just going to give you an example so um cho1 so all the way up in donegal mayo slag at that particular area there are three funded dietitian posts in that area and there hasn't been one application into the job uh, it took a year and a half to get a consultant psychologist to take up the post in wexford Okay. Um, CHO5 where I am so we have and everybody will have heard you know in relation to the situation in CAMS down in Kerry where since 2016 even though the post is funded we haven't been able to secure a consultant psychiatrist in so is that because sorry like to be kind of blunt people don't want to live in Kerry people don't want like why can't well you know I can't understand why anybody wouldn't want to live in Kerry Donegal or Wexford because they're all fabulous counties but or is I, it a financial so, thing like I can they make so more money in a private may, maybe and okay. some of the professionals I suppose want to work in the bigger centers so there are there are issues there but at the same time like we fund 74 consultant psychiatrists to work in CAMS and we have 68 in place so we're short six so we wouldn't have the percentages that in other particular areas right. it can be very challenging and I think you know t uh, Tara really hit on the fact in relation to how long it takes uh, to become a consultant as um, psychologist for example like when you start studying at 18 do you want to be still studying at 28 or 29 probably not, not everyone no. does yeah you know that's one of the issues and uh, if I could just touch on a point um, that that was made in relation Kate made in relation to um, I suppose you know 
prisoners and the situation in relation to um, mental health. And you know, we all saw the report the Mental Health Commission did last year and it was really hard hitting. So a couple of things we're doing at the moment, working in collaboration with the Department of Health and the Department of Justice, there is a committee in place and it's actually chaired by former Minister Kathleen Lynch, mm -hmm. um, you might all uh, have heard of her, and we're putting in place, we're trying to stop the revolving door. So when somebody is released from prison on a Friday evening, so it's, you know, it's a release from prison from the point of view, it's, it's put in place, it doesn't just happen, you know, we're short of capacity, you're just out the door. So it's planned. And the minimum that person should have if they do have a mental health illness, what they need to have when they're leaving prison is they need to have, for example, a medical card, they need to have some place to stay that night, and they need to have an appointment with a, with, with, with a mental health um, practitioner, counsellor, consultant, whoever, to support them. That's the first point. The other thing we're doing, we're doing a pilot scheme down in uh, Limerick at the moment, and it's in relation to diversion. And so you're talking about a young 18 or 19 year old person and they might have, um, they might have offended and they might have shoplifted four or five euros worth out of a shop and they might have a mental health illness. Prison is not the right place it's for them. Diverse, so. And what we're trying to do is divert. So a really, really big um, conference held in UL last week. Uh, we had police from uh, Canada, from Scotland, from Northern Ireland and America who are doing this really, really successfully and that's what we're looking at. So we're yeah. trying to think outside the box because mental health, as you know, is so vast. And as Tara said, it's not, and Harry's, it's yeah. not one size fits all. I'm very conscious of time. Um, Lisa, we'll take some questions there. Yeah, definitely. We'll, we'll do the Q&A now so if people just want to pop their hands up and we'll, we'll take some questions. I might definitely take a few together and then do that, go back yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is Riona. Um, I have a question for Minister Butler. Um, you mentioned in the CHOs there is a certain specialised eating disorder group of, of trainees. Is there any specialised eating disorder course that psychologists or therapists can take to have more experience and knowledge of eating disorders? Um, because I know in my own experience, a lot of the psychologists and therapists, they don't have any um, specific training in eating disorders. They only have background in addiction studies and cognitive behavioral therapy, which isn't very effective in certain EDs. Thank you. We're going to take like three questions together and then people can answer. Oh, yeah, that was really interesting. Thank you. My name is June. I'm a physio, but my question is more as a mother of three little girls. Um, and you've talked a lot about things that are being developed to treat eating disorders. My concern is while you're treating, there's still lots more young girls and boys that are developing them. And is there anything being done to address, you said the main cause is probably social media and what they're consuming. And while we do try and, you know, create body positivity at home and discuss you know, try to put things in context that they see online. I do think maybe there's something that needs to be done around that. But so I'd be interested to hear if there's anything so in the pipeline to prevention look. as well, like preventing. Or, yeah, prevention yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Hi, how are you? Uh, my name is Michelle. I'm a gym owner and I coach um, all women. Sorry, I'm very nervous. I can't talk at all. Um, but I just wanted to, um, I suppose, from uh, body image, uh, mental health, and eating disorder perspective as a person who's kind of coaching women, like obviously in, in this space, where you're doing a lot of obviously, it's all exercise and eating plans and all that kind of stuff. Um, obviously I'm not a psychologist, but I find that within my role, they, that tends to come up quite a lot, and um, particularly with the women that I, that I coach. And I suppose what I'm looking for is something that's like on a basic level, like where would I point somebody in the right direction so that I'm not claiming that I'm the professional in that area, but I can kind of support them and guide them to the, to the right place. Great, thank you. We have someone up here, Lisa. Thank you. My name is Ngozi. I'm from William Women Worldwide. I have a question because I have a colleague of mine. He has been doing night work for uh, close to 12 years and um, he had diabetes, he was so stressed, and he had a lot of uh, um, 
medical challenges and um, most of the medication he was giving started making him to add so much weight and um, at the end of the day he became obese and uh, he started researching into what happened to him because he tried as much as possible to eat healthy. So he went back to the doctor and the doctor was like, no, this med medication cannot make you add weight. So but at last, he went to another doctor and uh, he discovered that uh, some of the medication actually can make you become so hungry, add weight and start eating and become obese without you knowing it. So my question now is, in that case, how can somebody like him be helped? Because there are so many people that are obese because of medication they are taking without knowing that that is the cost. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we might have to, I think Lisa, one here, there's one more here, Lisa. Oh, I think. I, I would talk for a woman with disabilities and I would like to know if there are any options uh, for a woman with disabilities, I mean uh, with physical disabilities, to so get some uh, mental health support, maybe by medical cause, uh, because especially for those women who, who get disabled later in their life, it's very hard for them to overcome uh, the situation that their body is not, uh, and it used me, and they feel very unhappy and unloved, and I think uh, they need to get proper mental health, maybe psychotherapy or, or something else, free of charge. Men okay, uh, so mental health supports on medical cards yeah, for someone yeah. who has a physical disability. Me because a woman might feel very unloved, very un 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 pretty, un nice because of disability, uh, especially if, if a person used to be healthy and nice and, and now uh, they need to learn that it's okay not to be okay. And, uh, and could, could the, the mental health support be free of charge for people like that? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Lisa, we're going to have to start answering questions. Okay. Thanks, Lisa. Councillor Jared Rahini, I just want to ask, thank the panel obviously for the work that you're doing, and I just want to ask, is there any advice that you would give to a person who is aware that somebody has an eating disorder, a young girl. Have you any advice to that person as to how to help or what to do, what action to take? Okay. And the last question here, and then I'll touch on some of them and then because the panel might not be able to answer all of them. Thank you so much. I just want to ask at a be very basic level, at what point, or is there any prompt in our body that will tell you you are having eating disorder issue or the mental health is turning to mental illness at a very basic level? What prompt in our body? What should we look out for? Okay, I'll, I'll just speak to that f just from my experience. If, uh, from an eating disorder perspective, knowing that like, um, for me, it started by going on a diet. That was, that's like, was the most, and I think it's like one of the most dangerous things to do. So that's like your pathway in. And if you're thinking about food more than just, oh, I'm hungry, I should eat something. If it's about like, if you're trying to track calories, change your body through food, and it's becoming an obsession, that's when I knew that it was a problem. Um, and to um, your point, the, the gym instructor, the coach down there, um, BodyWise is an amazing resource. I wish that my coach had directed me to BodyWise when he realized that what I was doing was trying to use him to facilitate a really toxic uh, desire I had to, to change my weight and body. Because also coming back to the first panel, my period stopped for three and a half years because I was so underweight. And a lot of women who would be on the pill wouldn't know that that was happening. And it's happening to a lot of women doing CrossFit, other very intense exercise, that like if your period stops, it's literally your body way of saying like, there's really something wrong here. So BodyWise was an amazing resource. And to your point as well, if you think 
someone has an eating disorder, BodyWise has a great resource on like how to broach that. So what I would say if for a parent who's worried or if you know of somebody who has an eating disorder and you're worried about how to support them, there are kind of four places, four things to do to start. The first thing would be to go to the BodyWise website. The second thing would be to download the HSC self-care eating disorder app because that has um, lots of very short videos on all the aspects a person needs to know in the early days. Um, the third thing would be to sign up for our pillar program, which is our family support program. That is the place to start. Um, we learn about how to understand an eating disorder, uh, how do you talk to someone, where do you go, what do you do. So it's starting next Thursday morning, our next one is starting. Um, and then the fourth thing would be to read our treatment guide because that talks about the different pathways to treatment. So that's both the public pathway and the private pathway and the things that person needs to be aware of in relation to that. And in relation to the coach, I would often do training with gyms and with coaches on how to manage that within, the, within what you're doing. So if you want to get in touch with me, that's, I, I do that all the time. So you're welcome to do that. Yep. And can I just make one point here that I wouldn't ignore it because early intervention is key. Mm. And BodyWise, we fund BodyWise, my department funds BodyWise to work in collaboration with the clinical programs to support. They go into schools, they support so many people and the pillar program is absolutely fantastic. And you can recover from an eating disorder, but it is really, really important that you know, the intervention is made uh, um, at the very start. And just in relation to that lady uh, down there, mental health supports are there for everybody, regardless of whether you have a disability or not. So you can be referred through your GP. And just one point to make, at the moment, my mind are an absolutely fantastic organization that we fund also. They are providing 16 and a half thousand free hours of counseling at the moment. You can go online to their website, but what they do, which is so important, they provide it in 18 different languages, Ukrainian, Russian, every type of language, because 17% 70 of the people living in Ireland now uh, weren't born in Ireland. We just don't speak English and Irish anymore. So for anyone who's recovering from COVID, long COVID, um, emotional distress, because a huge amount of people, you know, it's a, we haven't time to get into it now, but I was really struck by the point you made in relation, everybody thinks their mental health, is mental health illness, because the pub was closed or they couldn't get their roofs done. They had emotional distress, you know, they were challenged. It took the stigma away from it. Uh, yes, okay, but, uh, yeah, let's, let's talk about this. You can answer the schools, but I also want the Minister and Tara maybe to uh, speak to the first point here about... Um, about... Yeah, so the first is, um, you're absolutely 100% correct. Um, eating disorders, um, and particularly because um, I work in the realm with obesity as well, is uh, we get very, very little input on this in clinical programs. Um, I wish we got an awful lot more because it is something that we see on an everyday basis uh, when we do work as clinicians. Um, it is seen as a specialised area, and unfortunately, um, we don't get a lot of funding to be trained in this. So typically, I've found for myself, because I work in this area, I've had to self-fund an awful lot of my training into this area. There is some beautiful um, programmes that you can do. Obviously, CBTE is kind of the main one, but DBT, which is electro behavioural therapy, absolutely fantastic for emotional eating or binge eating. Um, the compassionate model is the one that I use, so compassion-focused therapy that blowing the water at the moment with using a compassionate framework with adolescents and with adults that have disordered eating. So that would be the typical framework I would do. But it's really important to remember as a clinician when you're training that it is going to be an integrated approach. So it's really good to have a little bit of, 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 of everything. all of, of, of the multidisciplinary the, team. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. so, so everyone important. I'm yeah. sorry to be interrupting you now, but we are running out of time and I want, uh, Harriet, do you want to take that question? Um, yeah, and also just to say that the CBTE training is online and it's free. So it's on, there's a whole website dedicated to it, and you get you know you can do it, um, but if and and that kind of thing. So if you go onto our body image website, it has a whole section for parents on managing social media and body image for um, across all ages. And just the very last minute, if you wouldn't mind, Stephanie, um, the social media, the whole element of social media and social media abuse, it is being addressed through the Oireachtas now. 
Um, it needs to happen very, very soon. We have to offer protections to everybody. Anybody, young or old, can be abused on social media. So there's a huge amount of work being done in relation to that. And we need it. But we, we need the big players like the Facebooks and the Twitters and the TikToks and the Instagrams. They all have to buy into that as well. Kate, I might give you the last word and then Tara can answer the obesity question maybe privately when we finish. Yeah. Okay, yep. yeah, thank you. I just um, want to congratulate you for the, you know, uh, what you just spoke about, you know, developing the primary, you know, the booklet, the teaching from the primary school, because that's actually the point I wanted to talk about that, you know, even creating awareness and teaching our young body image. There's no size for fit all. Everybody is, comes in different size and shape. And when you're comfortable in the skin you are, you just have to accept who you are because no matter how you try, you can, you, if, you, if you're made to be fat or, or big or tall, you cannot control it in as much as we do a lot to help ourselves. So teaching our children from young age to understand and accept themselves the way they are, it helps to remove the psychological stress and um, identity crisis that they need and that you know, affect them. And from that, even isolation that starts from young age, you know, we also need to teach our children of, of diversity and integration, you know, to accept one another. Because you see that if in some schools, unfortunately, one of my friends relocated to uh, United Kingdom last December because her child, her five-year-old, comes back from school and crying. Mom, why am I, why am I black? Because her friends, uh, schoolmates couldn't play with her. So we, but we, we begin to teach our children to accept people the way they are and also teach them to be comfortable in whom they are. It will help them to develop a stronger mental wellness I, so that they won't have the crisis we adults are having when we grow. I feel absolutely terrible interrupting you, but I think it's a beautiful note to finish on. Um, and thank you to the panel and to Lisa. We could have been we the sole objective of this conference, you know, for all the different issues that we're, we're addressing. So we're just going to take a couple of minutes to do a quick change over to our final panel and get people mic'd up. And then we, we'll start with our, our fourth panel then. Um, looking to the future of women's healthcare, which is going to talk about a lot of different issues. But again, a positive note to finish on in case that was a really lovely note to finish that panel on. Thanks very much, Stephanie.
future of women's healthcare in Ireland, where do we go next? And we'll be focusing on our aspirations, what we'd like to achieve. And as you can see from our panel and our lineup, we have a very diverse uh, range of backgrounds here from professional experience and lived experience. And we have, of course, our Minister for Health here, who's here to listen and to respond to the issues being raised. And we will have a Q&A session at the end of the panel as well. So I'll hand you over to, to Kira Kelly, who's a former GP, Dr. Kira Kelly, and now broadcaster and a very familiar voice on our radios every day. Uh, and Kira is no stranger to asking the tough questions uh, and is a strong advocate for women's health care as well. So Kira, I'll hand over to you. Everybody here, or we, you, you can indeed. Um, thank you all very much for sticking around for, for the day today. I think it's really a wonderful thing that is happening here. Um, I'm old enough to remember when women's health was a sort of a, a, an also ran in health and panel. Um, Dr. Rono Mahoney, who will be very, very familiar to many of you, who is a consultant, obstetrician and gynaecologist and former master of Hollis Street. Uh, thank you very much for coming today as well. We have Mary Bridget Collins, who is the, and I want to get your title exactly right, the Assistant Coordinator of the Pavi Point Traveller Primary Health Care Project. And Mary Bridget has been very instrumental in, in highlighting the inequalities that traveller women in particular face in accessing healthcare and the biases that they deal with on an ongoing basis and uh, we'll be talking about all of that. And Dr. Anne Nolan who is uh, from the ESRI, we're going to be talking about demographics and we're going to be talking about research and whole life, whole life healthcare from, from uh, children. You were involved in the Growing Up in Ireland study, I know Anne, and thank you. And of course we're joined also by the Minister for Health, Stephen Donnelly. Um, and Minister, I believe you're here in largely a listening capacity. Uh, I, I will be no doubt asking you some questions, but I think it's, it's very good and important that we have the Minister here today to hear the concerns of women and to hear the, the lived experience of women, but also the expertise of women on this panel. Um, I think we might start with you, Lisa, largely because you're, you're sitting beside me. Um, when we talk about women's health, we often think of it as a niche and we often think of it as maybe being something that would be under the bailiwick of, of Rhone and we think of reproductive health, we think of abortion, we think of uh, maternity, gynaecology, those types of things. But women's health is obviously far broader than that and in, in, to a large extent the biggest killer would still be heart disease and then maybe followed by cancer. Um, we don't really think about heart disease as a women's health issue, but there are issues for women in accessing care for things like cardiology, things to do with maybe gender biases in medicine, isn't that correct? Absolutely, yeah. So I think given my background as emergency medicine consultant, a lot of people would think, you know, where would I have as much experience, you know, in dealing with women's health, but actually women's health issues is not just alone in relation to gynecology and obstetrics and reproductive health. So what I would see daily, on a daily basis, is that one of the largest killers of women is cardiovascular disease. And if I put it to you that a statistic that women are literally dying because of the gender bias, I think it's absolutely important for us to know. If I said to you about heart attacks, the first image I would guarantee that the majority of people will conjure up in their mind is a male clutching his chest, maybe a little poster that you've seen with it radiating down his left arm. That is not the symptoms that they have. heart attacks, they have a certain pathophysiology that will happen with it. We also know that that pathophysiology will give them a typical symptoms of heart attack, chest pain, radiate to the left arm, etc., and the image that you've just conjured up. However, women have a different pathophysiology, but we have the atypical symptoms of potentially like abdo pain, clamminess, burping and belching. And this is a personal experience for me because my own mother-in-law was misdiagnosed of having a heart attack while I was standing beside her to another practitioner. And I just felt this, but I think she's having a heart attack. No, no, she has no chest pain, it's fine. To this day, my mother-in-law, this is three years ago, she will still maintain that she didn't have a heart attack because she didn't have chest pain. She had a touch of the heart, is what she said, even after having her treatment and two stents put in. And I think of that age group, that is your atypical presentation. Now, I'll take it one step further. If you get misdiagnosed as having a heart attack and you're in the emergency department, you get sent home with your indigestion tablets as a woman and you're walking down the street and you have a cardiac arrest, heart attack, and women but this is something that I will encounter every single day, is the woman that comes into the emergency department and may get sent home because her, her symptoms of heart attack is not your typical one, which has been based on all the research over the last hundreds of years, which has been men. Now we are changing very, very good with that. 
But I think even that language, somebody was saying earlier on about the language, even saying that women are typically atypical, but it's because we're comparing that sort of thing to men. It's extraordinary what you just said, because you're talking about women being atypical. We're 51% of the population. No disrespect to you, Minister, but you're the atypical ones. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> we're actually the majority, but yet we're always sort of put in as if we're almost like a minority interest group, yep. I, 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 and that's insane. Um, one of the things you said, and it's funny because you've just reminded me of, of, of an occasion when I myself presented to, to A&E with a, with a terrible headache, and I don't get headaches ever, I don't suffer with headaches, and I had had a, a lumbar puncture three days beforehand, and, and actually what was happening was leaking some signs, right, there was ...experiencing was asked about how was my stress levels, mm -hmm. I thought, what chance do other women have? And uh, it's a very worrying thing. And does that go back to, you know, the, the beginning of medical culture is the hysterical woman and the stoic man. And we know that women are perceived as more behavioural, or as sometimes people would call it supratentorial, which doesn't exist. Supratentorial means that it's above your brain, which means it's outside, it's outside your head that you're thinking about these things. Migraines and headaches in women coming into the emergency department are horrendously underdiagnosed. They are the opportunities for strokes, which again, when you think of stroke, you think of the fast, positive, somebody face. But there are a certain cohort of people that will suffer from a stroke in the back of their brain that do not present like that. And women have a more higher chance of that. And headaches is one of the things that they may present with. So we're horrendously misdiagnosed from the typical conditions that would have been already perceived from a male research perspective. And before we move on from this, what can we do to address those gender biases? Because I remember being really shocked at, at how, how, it's probably leaking, lie down. <laughs> and it was all better so what can we do absolutely so one thing that I've gotten from today is I cannot wait to go back to work and be like right guys listen this is what we're going to do have an education sessions in relation to our medical practitioners who work in the likes of the ED which is my specialty to be able to tell them when the women come in this is the atypical presentations that they have and I encourage them to know a little bit more Dr. Avian said earlier on that um, she had two medical students that came around to her and they didn't know what hyperemesis gravidarum was I said if you were to ask them did they know what erectile dysfunction was I guarantee you they would and I think one of the reasons for that is that the erectile dysfunction is probably more so in the public domain as well versus the hyperemesis that we have maybe it's getting a little bit better now so education for the medical professionals mm. in relation to that but also the public perception as well for that guy that you've all just thought about with the heart attack actually having more posters of women and their little signs and symptoms that they have to have it just even in that public domain so education between the medical practitioners that we have that are forming the future and also for our public domain okay so we need to have a conversation and i guess that's what we're trying to do today rona you would be very much at the forefront of women's health as it, as it is perceived to be women's health, reproductive medicine, obs and gynae, all of those kinds of things. From your point of view, the gaps in the system, when you look at the future going forward, and I think a huge amount has changed in, in women's expectations around what they want from their interaction with doctors. And I always, I have to commend obs because when I was training as a doctor, I always felt obs was one of the few specialties that really did value the voices of women mm. because not all did, let's be honest. And, and I think OBS was already getting it that women needed and wanted a say in their own healthcare. But if you could perceive the gaps going forward or the important things in your area specialty around women's health, what would they be? Yeah, I mean, I think first of all, um, it's brilliant to be at this conference and like, you know, full credit to Senator Chambers because I think if you read um, the strategy that she is putting out, um, we're actually hitting a lot of the big issues that are coming um, down the line for women. But, um, and I think when you read it, you see the complexity of the issues we're dealing with and the tendency to, for it to become really politicized. So it actually becomes really difficult to even have the conversations. Yeah. But the big area, I mean, menopause, it's brilliant to see menopause coming back because so many women are living much longer than their reproductive years. You know, we've tended to have this big focus on the reproductive years and kind of menopause has been left out there. But this is the very time when women are suffering, you know, the comorbidities um, that these patients are getting older and having much more comorbidities. be dealing with um, actually when you think about the role that women play in society you know from growing up to bearing children and um, to rearing those children often to being the carers 
um, caring for parents, caring for those around them, um, and that kind of long life coming, playing a really central pivotal part in society. If you do not care for women, and if you do not address the issues facing them, then there's a whole intergenerational issue in terms of the care that's provided, and women's ability to take part in society. I mean, one of the biggest examples, you know, I think the most egregious law ever passed in this state, 1935, the Criminal Law Amendment Act, which banned contraception. I mean, you think of the impact that had on women who couldn't choose when to have their babies, who couldn't space their families, and were pretty much consigned to the home and couldn't work. Massive thing. We still have issues with childcare. You know, we still have issues with the cost of childcare for women trying to get out into society. So there's all of the social issues that go with women as well as the we'll healthcare issues. And there's a real... To the minister very shortly. Absolutely. And there's a conjuring of treatment. Think of that yeah, this is really interesting. I'll tell you why. It's because there's been a sudden big demand yeah. for the HRT that's given transdermally. So that's either by patch or by um, gel, and that's because you avoid taking high doses of HRT going through the liver, breaking that down and getting your HRT. This is going directly into your system. You're giving lower dose of better form HRT. You need a yam is one of the base products for that, but you have to grow your yam in advance. So for the last few years, we've had this massive increase in demand for this type of HRT. And then obviously with COVID, we had supply chains broken. But I think June, things are going to get a bit better and that kind of access. We've had stock outs, yeah. So yeah. when you go to get your patches, your gel, um, I'm getting very into that now my age, but um, when you go to get your gel, it has been quite difficult. There are alternatives there and kind of working around the system, but hopefully that supply chain will be, um, will be addressed. Do you think, though, the idea of a minister for women's health, I know, I know uh, independent TD Verona um, Murphy floated it this week, but Vicky Phelan, for example, has floated it before. Do you think it's a good idea or I not? I do, because do of the you? interlink with the, I said with the social issues, you know what I mean, and healthcare, there's just this tremendous link because you are looking at the cornerstone of society, how it rears the next generation, how it gives birth to the next generation, how it might choose not to give birth, how women choose their roles in society, allowing women to develop and grow according to what that potential is. Um, and that's what healthcare has to be all about is enabling women to get out there in society and to do all the yeah. things that they do. The, the big kind of clinical areas, I think, are menopause, urogynecology. The one thing I'm really passionate about is HPV yeah. um, vaccination, um, and all credit to Laura Brennan, and I often think of her and her family and the amazing work she did in turning around that whole story on HPV vaccination. We're now looking at a single dose vaccine coming up, and already we are seeing a reduction in the number of women in their 20s coming with advanced changes um, in cells around it's the cervix, kind of and the, that's amazing. The golden goose, isn't it? We have a, a prevention for cancer. We have a prevention. I couldn't be more passionate yeah, about it. I, I really couldn't. Um, and I think that's something. So we're having you know, all of these um, new things coming on stream, which we can really use to help, but it's about understanding that. But often they get politicized, and you, know, you have mixed messaging coming out, or you have messaging that's working against that, and that's not really helping anyone. Um, I think the other big areas, obviously, that you might want to look at is the mesh. You know, we've had big controversy in urogynecology, but at the same time, we have a whole cohort of women who are really suffering day to day with huge morbidity and who really got to look at that. Um, endometrial cancer is probably the most common cancer, and that instance is increasing. Um, in line with increasing age and obesity and all the factors that encourage endometrial cancer, Ovarian cancer, though, it might be more rare, but it is, unfortunately, has much poorer outcome. Yeah. And up until recently, our outcomes in Ireland haven't been as good as other outcomes in Europe. So we need to, re we are focusing on a huge amount of work has been done already, but we need to really focus on that centralized care for the treatment of cancer, the expert MDTs, making sure there's a standardized approach to all of our cancers. You know, we've seen the impact in units in the country. You know, we saw another Kenny delayed diagnosis of endometrial cancer and the impact that that can have on a disease that when it's caught early enough can be really treatable. So I think that's got to be because of the potential impact and because cancer kills women, that's got to be an area of real focus. And it's just really great to see the big four areas in Ireland now developing, but MDT developing and the whole services that support that, the radiology, um, and you know all the cancer treatments and the drug treatments and the medical backup for that, but that really needs a centralised approach. In fact, many of the diseases need that kind of expertise because when you think even come back to menopause, a lot of that can be managed and is managed brilliantly in the community. But there will be complex cases that need to have that expert. But even without complex cases, I think it's fair to say, and and I am a former GP, that GPs miss 
the, the menopause for years as well as the issue that it actually is. And I was talking to a friend of mine who would be the same age as me very recently and she was presenting with the thing that women do present with, am I going mad, have I, have I made, am I demented, I'm losing my memory and all those things that, that you, Absolutely. it isn't just the hot flushes as you said. No. And instead of her GP, who was a male GP, and that's just how it was, saying, oh, well, let's, you know, maybe it's the menopause because you're 51 and you're having all these symptoms. He said, right, yeah, maybe we'll send you to the early onset dementia clinic. And there was nothing wrong with her other than, the men but like, that's bad. That's very recent and that's not good. And, and yeah. so we have an issue around the training of doctors and maybe doctors' gaze being the male gaze as well, you know, that we were missing big pieces of the picture of what women need. I agree, and it's building up that experience because you know, when you think about it, it's not hot, you know, lack of sleep is one of the biggest things and that has a massive impact on quality of life. I don't know if anyone here has experienced not being able to sleep, but there is pretty much nothing worse. And then you're trying to get up the next day and you're just bit by bit, you're just finding yourself as well, you know what I mean, as well as... You know, when we look at the approach to healthcare, you know, I'm a great fan of, the approach which is about that information out there because women are pretty, in my experience, women are very smart. And when they have information, they're pretty good at telling, like your example, but many women are very good at expressing their symptoms, actually enable them to say, this is what's wrong with me and understanding this. And with the benefit of that kind of knowledge, then I think they can also present in partnership with their doctor. So it's not this kind of, I'm the doctor, I'm telling yeah. you this. It's like you're sitting there going, this is the problem on the table here. These are the possibilities. How are we going to find a treatment path that actually works? A collaborative works, approach, a, yeah. But a treatment path that works for you, the individual, in your particular yeah. setting. Um, because it's, you know, it's very easy to recommend all kinds of treatments that aren't available, maybe. Um, and really simple treatment. One example is physiotherapy after babies are born. If you're living in France, you know, you have automatically got access to four free, you know, physiotherapy sessions. That has a big impact on incontinence yeah. down the road. Really simple, really simple intervention. Um, no real side effects. I know that's in... Uh, yeah. So often in medicine, we spend our time spending millions on treating the end stage of a disease. And we could have, and we could have prevented much, so right. many of diseases, our lifestyle, related um, and that's a good message because we can actually do things that can make small things it's not that we all have to live perfectly no and I mean human being human doesn't allow you live perfectly and no. then, you know and that's maybe it we, we can want that but can I yeah. can I bring in Mary Bridget yourself um, we just been talking about accessing mm -hmm. health care and opportunities for women and, and you know that health is important so that women can live you know full lives and we need child care and we need prevention and we need all those things but traveller women face a much bigger hill to climb Definitely, as compared yeah. to, to, to other women yeah. in mm -hmm. terms of accessing this. What would make a difference to you and to the women that, that, that you work with and the women around you in terms of maybe being listened to by healthcare, mm -hmm. but also being able to access services? Because we know that traveller health outcomes are much worse than the settled the, community. It's true, the, the yeah. Longevity, all yeah. of those things. That, mm -hmm. like, it's a bit of an uphill struggle for it you. Is, so, it's, so what it's, do you need? Yeah, I think it's a bit of, it's, well, it's a huge struggle and always has been a huge struggle for lots of traveller women out there. And we know from the piece of research that we've done in 2010, which we would see now it's old information, but we know that traveller women, or well, travellers in general face huge discrimination. And I know you're talking about the general population and that they're getting past the front door, but in some cases, travellers don't even get past the front door, particularly for traveller women, because of the huge discrimination and the multiple forms of discrimination that travellers face within Irish society. But also, you're talking about the general population that does live much longer than what travellers live. Life expectancy for travellers is only 64 years of age. Now, that's both for men, and it's improved slightly for women, but it's gotten much worse for travelling men, and I know we're talking about women here today, and access and services is yeah. a real problem and discrimination. But also the literacy is a huge thing as well for lots of women out there. And we've seen during COVID where you had an awful lot of services put online. We work with travellers out there that don't even have electricity, mightn't have okay. the skills to use a phone, mightn't be able to go on the phone. So this isn't going to be another barrier in the future if lots of us has to go online to access services. And I know the group we had on before this and they're saying go online, get this and get that, but that doesn't suit everybody. So you already have a group about looking at I, I totally mm. take on board what you're saying I, mm. and I believe you that there's discrimination yeah. and there's mm. bias and there's a, a difficulty in accessing. So how do, we, how, do we, how do we change it? What do you need? 
Well, what we need, we need, we need extra supports there. And, and now, within the primary healthcare project, we do, there's about 25 of them around the country, and we do work with women as well. We give inf information, and education is very important. Let it be about breast examination, smear tests, healthy eating, young children around immunisation. That's all stuff that we do, because that's the woman within the household who actually kind of takes the lead in that kind of stuff as well. And we all know, like, childcare and stuff like that. I think we need more and more women around decision making for women's health and yeah. I think that's one thing we don't need a group of men to kind of be sitting at the table and if you look at politics and you look at women's role within politics there's very very few women within the doll that when we see them sitting down there's very very few women there and I think the day is gone when you have a group of men sitting around the table making decisions for uh, women there needs to be women at the table we're the people who knows what we're going through we know what we experience and we know what we experience of traveler women as well yeah. but we do know traveler women die, die much younger than the general population and we do know that government departments are coming out and are planning for people living longer into their 80s and 90s but if they look at the different groups of people they certainly wouldn't be planning for travelers because life expectancy again is only quite young out of 40,000 travelers we only got eight travelers over the age of 85 years of age I, like that's shocking out of 40,000 that was any other community that would be up around the that thing is that shocking. yes it is absolutely and that's the thing that we've been pushing for for the last number of years is the traveler health action plan and we have done lots of consultation with traveller groups and organisations around the whole country, and women as well has been involved as well. And we are waiting for this traveller action, health action plan to be published, also to be implemented. I know a lot of government departments are very good at doing different reports